Arthur, denk je aan de tijd? Arthur! Joehoe! Orion! Dies! Oh, Dies, hallo! Please be seated.
distinguished colleagues, mayor and aldermen of Wageningen municipality, rectors magnifici of, from abroad and from the Dutch universities, presidents of the four applied research institutes, TO2, members of the supervisory board of Wageningen University and Research, your excellencies, ambassadors and representatives of various countries, partners in science and society, staff and students, all very much welcomed by the 106 Dies Natalis of Wageningen University and research and also the change of directorship. The audience, the fact that we held this academic celebration in English language and the fact that there are so many international representatives and also staff here present is, I think, is an, a main token of the importance we attach to international science and international education, regardless of the sometimes hostile national debates. We have today two subjects. One subject is looking into the microbiomes of our planet. And the second one was the change of directorship for me to Professor Caroline Kuse, the next 49th Rector of Wageningen University and Research. So let us start with the first one. Microbiomes are communities of interacting microorganisms such as bacteria, viruses and fungi. The importance of these microbiomes to the functioning of ecosystems are very clear. They are there in the deep seas, they are there in our soils, they are there in our human bodies and in animal bodies, but they are also there in engineered systems. Life on planet relies heavily on microbiomes, um, and especially their large diversity and huge quantities. Microbiomes and microorganisms generate oxygen. They keep the soils healthy. They regulate our climate, and they play a crucial role in, for instance, food production. And of course, they also purify wastewater, and they are crucial for human health, but also for human diseases. Moreover, these microbiomes are also at the origins of life. Read, for instance, the major volume of Daniel Dennett's, his book from 2017, From Bacteria to Bach and Back. It's remarkable, seeing this importance of microbiomes, that we know so little on microbiomes. We know little on the diversities of their species. We know little on whether they are increasing or decreasing in diversity. We know very little on their survival on very harsh conditions. We know very little on how and why and when they cooperate with each other or not. So we need further understanding of these microbiomes, on the functioning of microbiomes, but also in how they function in different systems and how they make sure that they also help us to address the, the great ground challenges of our Earth. So we need more fundamental research into microbiomes, as well as much more applied research in their direct functioning. So we should not be too surprised that we see the emergence of microbiome centers, both in the Netherlands, where we have at the moment six of these microbiome centers, as well as around the world. And most of those microbiome centers are very much interdisciplinary, but usually they focus on one typical microbiome, either within humans or within ecosystems, or within engineered systems. Today, we will establish also a Wageningen microbiome center, and that will be a center which is indeed covering the full range of microbiomes. Microbiomes we live in humans and in animals, in our gut systems, uh, microbiomes which are there in ecosystems out there, and microbiomes which function in engineered systems, which help us to, for instance, produce all kinds of food. We do that also in a new research building, which we are at the moment planning to be built, and which will house all our microbiome groups, which are really at the core of microbiome research. And they also, this building also is a hotel function for all the other individual scientists and groups within Wagner University and Research, but also outside that which works on microbiomes. Moreover, also this new building will host the major facility, the UNLUCK, global facility, which is a new open facility 
uh, on microbiome research, which has been granted to Wagner University together with the TU Delft, and where we have all kinds of new lab facilities as well as data facilities to study and understand the functioning of microbes in order to also unravel how they work and also to apply them in all kinds of systems. As you know, I am not a professor in, on microbiomes or microbiology, so it's with great pleasure that we can welcome here today one of the experts in microbiome research, and that is Professor Nicole Dubillier of the University of Bremen. She studied in Hamburg in different directions, in zoology, biochemistry, microbiology, and she specialized thereafter especially in marine biology. Currently, she is professor at the University of Bremen of microbial, microbial symbiosis and head of the Department of Symbiosis. Her fieldwork is really around the world, and especially in the seas and the deep seas. She also received numerous awards of the wor her work uh, on different studies on the microbiomes, and she communicates also very widely and broadly to the, the public on her work. So please welcome today our keynote speaker, Professor Nicole Dubillier. It's my great pleasure to be here today, and many thanks to the Rector Magnificus Automol for inviting me. Um, it's really a very impressive celebration. For me, it's the first time I'm experiencing it, and, it, and it's delightful. Um, I searched the web for uh, uh, what I thought might be exciting pictures of microbiologists at hard at work. And these were some of the most exciting pictures <laughs> that I could find. And um, at least when I started my studies, what I couldn't understand was why anyone would want to be a microbiologist. Mainly, you're looking through a microscope. These are tiny organisms. You can't see them. People get super excited about the, how they grow, uh, which means simply that they divide, and whether they're in a lag phase or an exponential phase or a stationary phase. And that seemed to me like pretty much all that microbes had to offer. And so what I wanted to be was a marine biologist, right? This was, uh, I had this vision that I was going to be diving along coral reefs and that the water would be at least 25 degrees warm and that I would spend my mornings in the field diving, then go back into the lab and do a little bit of lab work. And, and I didn't even understand the whole process of, of writing papers or anything like that or during reviews. Uh, so for my master's thesis, uh, the reality looked a little bit different. Uh, it was uh, in the Wadden Sea. And it was in very, very muddy sediments that I was working. You would sink in very deep. It would creep into uh, practically everywhere. And uh, I was working on benthic animals and trying to understand uh, how they tolerate low oxygen and high sulfite concentrations. And what I realized was this really has to change. Uh, if I'm going to stay in science, I need to figure out a different research topic. And my PhD advisor, Olaf Gira at the University of Hamburg, suggested that I could work on little worms. These are worms that are so small that you can barely see them with your naked eye. They're only two centimeters long and half a millimeter wide. And I remember when I, as a student, had first uh, heard Professor Gira give talks, and I always thought, how sad is that to dedicate your entire research life to worms, which is what I work on now. Um, uh, so uh, that, that I wasn't really convinced that these would be this would be exciting research. Then he explained where they, you could collect these worms, <laughs> um, and uh, and and their main distribution area is in tropical and subtropical coral reefs and seagrass sediments. And, and then I thought, well, I could do that. Uh, first trip went to Bermuda, but. Obviously, um, there's something else that's interesting about these worms and that I will uh, uh, try to explain during my talk. 
They don't have a mouth, they don't have a gut, they don't have an anus, and yet they are able to live. And that's because they live in symbiosis with microorganisms that provide them with nutrition. Um, and these are symbioses, and I just like to uh, emphasize that it's only in the last decades that we have begun to understand how important symbiosis is for the evolution of life. And uh, uh, beginning with Darwin and for, for many uh, decades afterwards, the focus was very strongly on competition and predation. But we now know, thanks to microbiome research and thanks to understanding that uh, many microbes have beneficial roles uh, in their associations with plants and with animals, uh, that uh, uh, mutualistic interactions form the basis of many species-rich ecosystems. Symbioses on land have been well studied for centuries because they're much easier to reach than those in the oceans, but that's where we have the highest biodiversity of uh, organisms, and 70% of our oceans, of our planet surface, are oceans. The ones that have been studied well are corals, but we're still struggling to understand, for example, bleaching effects and exactly what the communication, how the communication between the symbiotic algae and the host breaks down. The energy source for these symbioses is sunlight, photosynthesis. They have primary producers in the form of algae that live inside their body, they use sunlight as an energy to fix CO2 into organic carbon and feed the coral host. So it's photosynthetic or photosymbioses. The gutless marine worms that I began working on, however, although they occur in shallow waters, they live in the sediment. There's not enough light there for them to harbor photosynthetic microorganisms. So they must be gaining their nutrition differently. And now I'm going to take you to the bottom of the deep sea, which was uh, and a discovery, the discovery of hydrothermal vents in 1977, because until that time, although researchers knew that these gutless worms occurred in shallow water sediments, and they realized they didn't have a mouth or a gut, they didn't understand how they were gaining their nutrition. That changed in 1977. Uh, what you see here is the first manned submersible, or first submersible period that was used by research to go to the bottom of the ocean. Before then, it was not possible to reach the deep sea. Uh, the submersibles were developed by the uh, Navy, and uh, the US Navy uh, gave uh, Alvin here, which many of you might have already seen in videos, uh, to the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Geologists were looking for hot springs in the deep sea, and the reason they were looking for them was because uh, there was evidence that hot springs, as we know them from Iceland, where it's just recently erupted, that uh, there were hot springs also in the deep sea in the ocean where the tectonic plates are moving apart. These are huge spreading ridges in the deep sea. Uh, magma rises up from the Earth's mantle, and it forms new ocean crusts. We estimate about at the speed that your fingernails are growing, so that you can get an idea of, of the speed with which uh, they spread apart. And in, in magmatically uh, strong areas, hot vents, hydrothermal vents develop. And so geologists went down with Alvin 3,000 meters deep off Galapagos Islands, and they were looking for these hot springs in the deep sea. What they knew was that most of the deep sea is a desert. And these are super exciting images of the deep sea because you see something. Most of it is just mud. Um, and what you see here is a sea, sea cucumber or a, 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 a sea star. Uh, but otherwise, you see nothing or very little. And the reason for that is because there's very little food in the deep sea. And that's because life on Earth, animal communities, are dependent on primary production. Uh, and what you see here are trophic food webs, and at the basis always lies primary producers. And it was assumed until the discovery of these hydrothermal vents that 
you couldn't have large animal communities without sunlight, that this was the form of primary production that fueled all large animal communities. And uh, from the surface of the oceans, there's very little of the primary production from algae that actually makes it to the deep sea because it's all being eaten up uh, by, the, uh, uh, by the zooplankton that is in the water column or it is decaying. So now you have to imagine there are two geologists with the pilot, and they're sitting in the Alvin. They've gotten down to 3,000 meters water depth. And they start to see lava, which, which they had expected, uh, that they thought would be down there at the bottom of the sea. Um, and they started to see shimmering water as an indicator that they were getting near hot springs. But what was completely amazing and thrilling to them was to discover these gigantic animal communities at 3,000 meters water depth. What you see down here are gigantic tube worms. They're as big as my arm and as thick as my arm. Uh, they weren't quite sure at the time what kind of animal it was. It's reported that the geologist uh, called up to the mothership and said uh, to the only student on board that was studying biology, uh, isn't the deep sea supposed to be a desert? And she said, yeah. And they said, because there are a lot of animals down here. <laughs> so their question was, of course, what is the source of primary production that is fueling these large animal communities? How can we understand uh, what is supporting uh, these ecosystems? And so it became very clear when the first samples came up from the submersible, they reeked of hydrogen sulfide. And that's that smell of rotten eggs. If you've ever gone out uh, in the Wadden Sea and dug a little bit deeper and it starts to smell all rotten, that's hydrogen <coughs> sulfide, but also methane and hydrogen. And if you take those reduced compounds and you bring them together with oxidized compounds like oxygen, of which there's plenty in the deep ocean, then you get energy. If you've ever had hydrogen and oxygen come together, you know that you can have a Knigas uh, reaction where a lot of energy is released. Microbes have harnessed that energy and can use it in a process called chemosynthesis. Um, to actually then fix CO2. So this is what's driving these communities at hydrothermal vents. So in, in contrast to primary productivity from photosynthesis, in chemosynthesis, what you have is the chemical energy from the oxidation of reduced compounds. Symbiotic bacteria can use that to make ATP to gain energy, fix CO2 into organic compounds, and then uh, the reward is they get eaten by the host. So it, these are farming symbioses where the host then lives from the chemosynthetic energy production of their animal host. The discovery of these deep sea hydrothermal vents completely revolutionized our understanding of the energy sources that fuel life on Earth. Microbiologists had known about chemosynthesis long before, uh, over 100 years earlier, but that they fuel this kind, these kinds of ecosystems. This is what was new. And we now know that chemosynthesis can form the basis for large animal communities. And the biomass is, is very high, as high as that of tropical rainforests. We like to call them the oases in the deep sea or the rainforests of the deep sea. And they're based entirely on microbial symbioses. This fuels, these symbiotic microbiomes fuels these communities. In my lab, we work on deep sea mussels, not the large tube worms that I showed you. And they form these incredibly large, massive mussel beds in the deep sea. And the biomass, the, the number of, of, of mussels or carbon that they produce per square meter is two to five times higher than their shallow water relatives. And that's because they don't have to do the hard work that shallow water blue mussels have to do to filter and get all that plankton into them. They can just hang out there and have their symbiotic microorganisms in them and have a little bit of oxidized seawater coming in, a little bit of reduced water from the vents, and harness that energy. I'm going to show you a video of a research cruise that we did to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge with uh, the research vessel Meteor. We're zooming out from the Max Planck Institute campus where I'm a director. We had a research cruise to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. 
You'll see the four vent sites that we visited. They all have Russian names. That's because uh, if you discover a vent site, you get to name it. And these were all discovered by Russian scientists. The French uh, have a lot of names like Lucky Strike and Guinness for some of their vent sites. And I named one called Clueless because we had no idea where we were when we were diving down at the bottom of the ocean. We work with remotely operated vehicles. So these are unmanned submersibles that uh, are on a tether from the ship through an umbilical cord, which provides the energy, but also through uh, fiber optics, allows us in real time to see where the submersible is on the sea floor and to work with the arms that are on the robot so that we can collect samples, but also take images like these. As you get closer to hydrothermal vents, you start to see the shimmering water from the very hot water up to 413 degrees has been measured as it comes out of the black smokers. And as you move closer to the hydrothermal vents, you start to see these incredibly huge muscle beds uh, that you can see here. And there are many other animals that can then thrive off of them. Here are sea stars uh, or annelids that, that, that colonize the surface of them. The black smokers are particularly uh, fascinating and beautiful and often shown in deep sea um, films where this is a beehive-like structure uh, where I had the great fortune of measuring some of the hottest temperatures on Earth, 413 degrees to our knowledge is the highest. And we have special designed uh, instruments that are gas tight and temperature that can stand these high temperatures so that we can collect the fluids and then analyze which of the energy sources are available at these vent sites. Um, what you're going to see here are a very impressive deep sea shrimp. They're called Rimicaris. They've lost their eyes, but they have gained a third eye on the back of their head that allows them to detect temperature. The crabs, as you see, uh, love to eat them. Uh, that's important because they want to avoid the super hot waters. Uh, every once in a while, we see cooked shrimp at the bottom of a smoker because something went wrong with their ability to detect it. What you see here is the mussels look very similar to their shallow water uh, relatives. Here we're in the control van, and we're telling the pilots what to do in the deep sea. And what you can see here is that they're working with a small little arm manipulator to work the arm, the claw of the ROV. And what we're doing here, this is still one of my favorite experiments, we're still analyzing the data, is that we're taking the mussels and we're fixing them at the bottom of the sea in 3,000 meters in RNA later, it's a fixative that you use to look at uh, the genome and transcriptome of the organisms because uh, we're seeing that bringing them up through 3,000 meters is not a great way to look at what they're doing in the deep sea. What you see here is we've transplanted the mussels away from the energy sources because we're interested what happens to the symbiosis there. Is there a breakdown of it similar to corals? How does that breakdown happen? And what you can see here is that there's not a lot of room on the ROV for all our instruments. So we designed an elevator where we uh, also bring down extra equipment that we have. Uh, cost 20,000 euros and we lost it on the first cruise <laughs> in the deep sea. Spent a whole day trying to look for it again, but never found it. Um, so it's also expensive research. Um, um, what you can see here is we spend 12 hours during the day. The ROV goes into the water usually at 8 in the morning. It comes up at 8 at night. Um, and we've already been working in the van for the whole day with the pilots uh, on, 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 on the sampling itself. But now comes for us the hard part in the lab because we need to fix them for all sorts of methods, for imaging methods, for omic methods, for experiments. Uh, we're, as you can see here, super eager. We, we race to get our muscles as quickly as we can because those that we didn't fix in the deep sea and that are alive, uh, we want to get into cold water. When we work in warm waters, it's 25 degrees at the surface, and they're not happy there because down at the deep sea, uh, the hottest they go is 18 degrees. 
And what you'll see now is going to be a microcomputer tomography image. As we're zooming into a muscle now, we just opened it, and you're going to see a tomography, a micro CT, or like a CAT scan like you would do in the hospital, where we're dissecting through the muscle and looking into the muscle. And what you will see as we go through the shells are big, fleshy gills of the animals. This is the organ uh, that it's now being revealed, these brown tissues that are layered and lying there. And they are usually so small in your shallow water muscles that you won't see them. And here they're greatly enlarged, and that's because that's the organ that is harboring the symbiotic bacteria. That's made out of thousands and thousands of uh, slats, like vertical slats in a curtain, that are called filaments. And these are greatly enlarged. Uh, and what you're going to now see is imaging methods like fluorescent and cytohybridization, where we can visualize the symbiotic bacteria inside the cells. And here there are two types that are, uh, you could see types that use sulfur as an energy source and one that use methane. I did a calculation here of how many inhabitants you have in the city of Wageningen and how many are in an eight centimeter large muscle. And what you can see is that the muscle of only eight centimeters packs in a lot more symbiotic inhabitants um, than here in Wageningen. And that's because it has increased the organ in which it carries it over 40 fold to be able to house them. Um, I promised I would stick to 25 minutes, and so I want to make sure that... Um, oh, great. So I can also show you what it's like um, to sample a shallow water habitat. Um, okay, so we discovered these chemosynthetic symbioses in the deep sea at hydrothermal vents. Very shortly afterwards, they were discovered at cold seeps, hydrocarbon seeps. Uh, in fact, the oil industry had often known that there were animals there. Uh, uh, and, and, and these are sites where we can also find chemosynthetic symbioses. Particularly fascinating are whale falls. When uh, whales sink to the bottom of the ocean, their meat disappears very quickly within only a few months. But their bones are full of oil. And sulfate-reducing bacteria then start using this oil and processing it, and hydrogen sulfide develops. And these little pink, uh, um, well, actually, I should be showing this way. Uh, these little pink uh, uh, spots that you see here are uh, little annelids that are actually closely related to the large tube worms in the deep sea, and they have bone-degrading symbionts, so not sulfide-degrading, but can actually degrade the bones of these whale falls. But what is remarkable to this day is that we had to go to the bottom of the ocean to realize that these types of chemosynthetic symbioses are in our backyard, that they're in shallow water sediments. Again, zoologists knew of animals in shallow water sediments that didn't have a mouth and a gut, but they didn't understand how they were gaining their nutrition. And so we now know in the shallow water gutless marine worms, going back to the ones that I first began studying in my uh, postdoc, that although they live in uh, environments that are driven by photosynthesis like uh, coral reefs and like seagrass meadows, that the animals themselves, because they live in the sediment, have sulfide oxidizing bacteria that are providing them with nutrition. And just to give you a little impression of what it's like when we collect them, working in the deep sea is expensive, going out with these vessels, 50,000 euros a day is what we estimate, uh, and a workhorse ROV is about 2 million, and then you need the crew of about uh, six pilots uh, to that, that you need to hire year-round that actually fly them. When we go out and collect our shallow water um, worms, this is the sophisticated equipment we need. We need a bucket uh, and a sieve. And I'll show you what it looks like. Uh, this is, by the way, Olaf Gira, my PhD advisor, and Chris Arzeos, a taxonomist who can actually tell these worms apart morphologically, which is really an art in itself. Caribou Key is a research station of the Smithsonian on the Belize Great Barrier Reef. And you can, uh, it's, 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 it's wonderful to be able to go out there as a research scientist. And we go out straight from the island, it's a teeny tiny island, we go out with a bucket. And uh, in knee deep water, 
we collect the sediment. Um, usually we go down about 10 or 20 centimeters with our hands, scoop it into a bucket. Then we take the bucket back to the lab. Um, you'll see it's a very uh, simple and rustic uh, lab that we work in, but we love it. Um, it's a real luxury to spend two weeks there. You just um, you do something called decantation, which is just a method uh, in which the worms then are lighter than the sand. The sand falls down quickly. And this is what you then see in a microscope. And everything that is white is a chemosynthetic host. And that's because they have lots of sulfur inside of them. And that's why they're white in what you're seeing here. So they're very easy for us to collect. All right. So why uh, would anybody care about uh, gutless marine worms and deep sea mussels? Uh, and we'll be hearing three more talks that will make it very clear that uh, beneficial microorganisms, symbiotic microorganisms, are ubiquitous. And I'll finish up uh, with emphasizing the importance of microbial symbioses, that it was not competition alone and predation alone that drove the incredible, remarkable diversity of life on our planet. Uh, all, almost all plants and almost all uh, animals, and certainly humans, live in close intimacy with millions and millions of beneficial microorganisms. And cooperation and symbiosis have played a key role in the evolution of life uh, and our planet's biodiversity. And with that, um, these are the funding sources that allowed me to do this research and my group. And I thank you for your attention. And again, thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much, Professor Dubillier, for your nice talk. It was very uh, engaging, and it's really remarkable how difficult it is to do this research in the deep sea and mm -hmm. how relatively easy it is to do at the shallow sea. <laughs> yes. Thank, Thank you very much for you. your talk. Uh, one more hand for Professor Nicole Dubillier. I think we are in now also for some uh, lighter stuff, well, lighter. Uh, uh, a different kind of thing. Uh, let me introduce to us a, a, a musical interlude. Uh, uh, Hans Dulfer is one of Holland's best known music musicians, uh, and especially uh, one of the most versatile musicians. He closely follows the latest trend, although he is uh, already at an age, and I can say that because he's even older than I am. And he plays even longer than I have lived, so he plays since 1957. Uh, now you can count how old I am uh, about that. He plays with different uh, uh, bands in the Netherlands, uh, and he is one of the most prominent figures in the, the Netherlands jazz scene. And of course, he is also very, very well known because he also brought up his daughter playing also the saxophone. So please uh, give a hand to uh, Hans Dulfer and his band. He plays together today with Joost Kroon on drums, Jeroen Hall on guitar, Ivor Michel on bass, and of course Hans Dulfer himself on the saxophone. Great to have you. Great. Hi, good to have you.
One more hand, please, for Hans Dorfer and Hans Dorfer. Hans wil nog wat zeggen. Ja, het is voor dit. Wat is het tijd nu als je naar je huis en je zit en je gaat luisteren naar dit? Ja? Dank je wel. En sommigen van jullie weten dat ik een heel, heel, heel amateur saxofoon player ben. Dus dat is. Oké, okay, we gaan onze uh, uh, programma on the microbiome. En ik ben heel blij dat we hier op de stage hier to the stage three of our bright young scientists who will illustrate on their work that they are doing in the labs on the microbiome. Please come to the floor. Uh, Alejandro Berlinches de Gea. Alejandro. <laughs> Hannah Augustijn. And Antanasia Ioannou. And we start with Alejandro. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as we navigate through an era of an unprecedented global change, we find ourselves confronted with a stark reality, the alarming decline of global biodiversity. Around 54% of the wildlife population density is expected to be lost in the next 80 years if we do not act. And depending on the actions that we make, we can even bend the curve of biodiversity loss. But if you focus on this picture, you will see that all the icons depict big plants, or mammals, birds, animals, almost suggesting that Earth's biodiversity is dominated by them, by plants and animals. But as you can imagine, due to today's topic, that's far from reality. And it's necessary and crucial to recognize that biodiversity is not just a matter of charismatic species in beautiful rainforests or in majestic savannas, but actually, it mostly is microscopic and resides beneath our feet, within the soil. Did you know that a staggering 60% of the total biodiversity on Earth is estimated to live in soils? Yes, you heard that right. 60% of the total biodiversity on Earth is estimated to reside in soils. But not only that, only a 1% of it, it is estimated to be known. Yes, you also heard that right. Only a 1% of the soil biodiversity on Earth, on, on soil, is known. I don't know if you can see this, it's a jar containing soil, little amount of soil, probably insignificant, especially from the back of the room that you probably cannot even see it. Well, in this jar, we might contain millions of bacteria, meters of, of, of fungi hyphae, or thousands of tiny amoebae. But the relentless march of the human-driven global changes, such as drought, has taken its toll in this hidden ecosystem. And it is said that approximately 2.8 tons of soil are lost annually per hectare, according to the European Soil Data Center. But why are all these microorganisms important, you might ask? Well, apart of being the majority of the soil biodiversity and the majority of the biodiversity in the world, they provide us with ecosystem services that are crucial for our life. They can generate compounds that are necessary for uh, the creation of, of vaccines, they help capturing CO2 in the ecosystems. But today I'm going to focus on their function, helping plant growth. Bacteria and fungi, normally they decompose the organic matter. But they are a bit selfish, and they do not completely share those nutrients with the plants. And these nutrients are necessary for, for plant growth. And here is where predators enter in this narrative. And now we are not talking about sharks or lions. These predators are tiny, they are microscopic. This is the hyper-diverse world of protists and nematodes. Protists are all the eukaryotes that are not fungi, animals, or plants, and I can tell you that they are the majority of the eukaryotes. 
And nematodes are the uh, most abundant animal in the world. Well, they predate, for instance, protists, they can predate on what in comparison are much bigger organisms. And in some of them, they do it by pack hunting, as lions do. If you don't believe me, you can see this video. In this video, you see this round organism, that's Cryptodiflugia operculata, a protist that basically is uh, hunting down a what in comparison is a much bigger nematode, and they do it by pack hunting. They can also predate on harmful pathogens, but especially through predation, they release the nutrients selfishly stored by bacteria and fungi, and they make them accessible to plants. Additionally, through the predation, they can shape the microbiome in a way that it creates conditions, conditions conducive to plant growth. Our research delves into the profound impact that soil microbiome predators have on plant performance, especially in the face of global changes, such as drought, fertilization, pathogens, big problems nowadays. Well, and the results actually are pretty interesting. <laughs> Take, for instance, the first experiment with tomato. In here, we had pods with or without drought, and with or without pathogens. And in all of those treatments, we had an increasing diversity of soil microbiome predators. From zero species, we increased the diversity until reaching 30 species of soil microbiome predators. And we found that an increasing diversity of these predators actually had a positive impact on plant growth when facing pathogens. However, not the entire picture was as beautiful. When facing drought, an increasing diversity of microbiome predators affected negatively the plants. This highlights the critical importance that global changes have on the relationship between soil biodiversity and plant health. In another of our experiments, this time with cannabis sativa and dealing with the fertilization problem, we created an experiment in which pods contain different levels of fertilization. From zero, we did an add fertilization, to low, medium, or high fertilization treatments. And again, in all of those treatments, we added an increasing diversity of soil microbiome predators. Overall, we showed that just by adding these soil microbiome predators, um, the plant performance was impacted positively. But the most interesting result is the next one. Oh, sorry. From zero, we increased the diversity zero to six, 12, and 24 species. This is the results I was referring to. In the upper row, you can see the treatment with only fertilization. And in the bottom row, you can see fertilization and diversity of microbiome predators added. And what we can see is that by adding these predators to the low fertilization treatment, we can already achieve a biomass that is comparable than when we only use high fertilization treatments. This might open the door to future research and for the application of these microbiome predators to reduce the need for fertilization. In conclusion, microbiome predators, they have the potential to steer plant growth and production especially in the face of global changes. However, biodiversity is not yet a one-for-all solution, and it really depends on the human-driven global changes. But let's not forget the bigger picture here. Soils host approximately 60% of the total biodiversity on Earth, and microbes, which is the majority of that diversity, is not just a resource for us to exploit. Yes, it can provide with services, Yes, the potential of application is certainly there, but actually, the significance goes far beyond human utility. Thank you very much. <laughs> and now, if you want to know what triggers these millions of microorganisms to perform their functions, then listen to the next speaker, Hannah. So today, I would like to tell you all about these small molecules, uh, what we call metabolites, that bacteria can produce. 
And I think that many of you are already quite familiar with at least some of these metabolites. Think, for instance, of a nice summer day. You're walking outside. can just be outside here on campus, but perhaps in a nice forest as well. And it hasn't rained in a while, so the ground is quite dry. But then we do get this much-needed summer rain. And what happens then is that you really can get this smell, this foresty, earthy smell. You could even perhaps call it the smell of rain. And this smell I personally really like because it reminds me of summer, it reminds me of this area I grew up in, but it's not just some random smell. It is one of these metabolites that I just mentioned. Its name is geosmin, and it's produced by actinobacteria that live in the soils all around us. And this is just an example of one class of bacteria that produce one specific metabolite. But if you look at these forest environments, there's way more going on. And to investigate this, we have to dive into the lab. So when we do that and we look into these soils, we can identify the bacteria living there. For instance, these actinobacteria that I already mentioned. But we just learned from our previous talks too that these microbes are not just living there alone. There's many other living there. And in turn, each of these microbes can produce many different of these metabolites. And these metabolites don't just influence themselves, but they also can influence their host. Think, for instance, as a growth agent to a plant, or if two bacteria compete with each other, they can produce antibiotics. And this also brings a bit of a problem. If you think of all these microbes, thousands of them, all these different metabolites, where do we even start studying these? How do we prioritize what bacteria to pick if we, for instance, are looking for a new antibiotic? And in my work, I create computer programs and software that can help with this. To really understand how these methods work, we first need to understand how these bacteria can actually produce these metabolites. So going back into the lab, if we start growing these bacteria, we could start looking at the metabolites that they produce. But to fully get the complete picture, we have to look at their DNA. And not just the DNA, specifically, we have to look at their genes. So we normally show a gene as being an arrow. Uh, and one of these genes can produce roughly one building block of these metabolites that we're so interested in. And very conveniently for us in bacteria, very often we see that the genes that work together to produce the building blocks of one metabolite are clustered together in what we call a gene cluster. And this is something that I can use my computer models for to detect. And with that, with this detection, we can actually say, OK, maybe this one bacteria has the capabilities to produce an antibiotic just from looking at the DNA. But then we're not fully there yet. If we think back of this first example that I gave about geosmin, there was another factor. For geosmin to be released into the air, there was the rain. And then we could smell this metabolite. So there, you must imagine that in a forest, there are so many different changing conditions that we cannot really mimic in our lab environments. So we need to look at what actually activates these gene clusters in producing these metabolites that we want to have, or we may miss a lot in our research. So because of this, the whole data analysis can be quite overwhelming. You have all these bacteria, all these metabolites, all these gene clusters, and now even there's also these triggers that we need to find. So to make that more simple, in my work, I create these computer uh, programs. And then specifically in my work, I work on the trigger that can actually activate these gene clusters into, produ into production. Um, and with this, we can go from just analyzing a couple of these genes and gene clusters and metabolites to actually starting to fill in the blanks and explore hundreds of them at the same time. And because we work on computer programs, 
it's not just me working on my hypotheses, so just me looking at, for instance, a new antibiotic, but we can share this all around the world and have hundreds of people working at the same time with these computer programs to investigate their own hypotheses. Thank you. <laughs> So now I would like to introduce our next speaker, Athanasia, and she will talk about how to apply some of these methods for synthetic communities. From deep within the oceans and the rich ground below to the endless fields of crops, and even on our favorite friends, Microbes are everywhere. They're naturally found in our bodies. We can find them on our skin, in our nose, and in our guts, where there are at least as many as the cells in our entire body. And about gut microbes, I'll be talking to you today. But how do we benefit from them? Microbes in our gut help us with profitable food fermentation, such as that of the fibers found in vegetables and fruits. They also produce compounds that we cannot synthesize ourselves, like vitamin K. And they help us stay healthy by leaving no space for pathogens or by showing them off to our immune system. Each one of us has a unique gut microbiome, as unique as our fingerprints. And the process of getting our unique gut microbiome starts from the moment we are born. By entering the world, we start taking along microbes from our mothers and the environment around us. The composition of the infant gut microbiome relies a lot on these environmental factors, but mainly on feeding. Breastfeeding is a suggested form of infant nutrition by the World Health Organization. That is because it's beneficial for infant health, with lower occurrences of diseases like asthma and eczema, a lower tendency for obesity, and better cognition development. However, as of December 2023, the World Health Organization estimates that only 44% of infants are exclusively breastfed up to the age of six months. This is a highly pressing issue because first-generation <coughs> infant formula has been associated with allergies, eczema, and obesity. This means that by harnessing optimal infant nutrition, we can safeguard and improve infant health. And this also involves the infant gut microbiota. This means the microorganisms that live in the infant gut. That is because human milk, the golden standard of infant nutrition, not only feeds the babies, but also the bacteria in the infant gut. And let me show you how that is. Human milk contains certain sugars that are called human milk oligosaccharides. And here on, I will show them to you as HMOs. These sugars reach the infant gut almost undigested, and there they can be utilized by certain bacteria that can degrade them. Some bacteria can degrade the sugars, and others cannot. We hypothesize that the bacteria that cannot degrade the sugars collaborate with the bacteria that can in order to survive. However, we don't exactly know how this teamwork leads to the formation of the infant gut microbiota. And to understand this better, we build synthetic communities. These are selections of bacteria that are naturally found in the gut of vaginally born breastfed infants that we put together as we try to model the infant gut microbiota. We like to think of them as construction materials. Just as in a real construction site, we put together different materials to make a bigger complex structure. And of course, building something from scratch is not a direct process. It needs investigating how each one of the materials fits with the others to make intermediate structures before finalizing the complete complex structure. In the same logic, we start by looking into how different bacteria found naturally in the gut of vaginally born breastfed infants degrade these human milk oligosaccharides. We put together bacteria of different capacities and based on their interactions, we create our synthetic communities, which we then use to test how human milk oligosaccharides beneficially impact the gut microbiota. Up till now, 
our research has shown that synthetic communities are an accurate model for the representation of the infant gut microbiota. Not only there is community survival in human milk oligosaccharides, but also following our hypothesis, there is collaboration between the bacteria that cannot degrade human milk oligosaccharides and the bacteria that can in order for the first to survive. Also, our synthetic communities are able to match the infant gut microbiota in terms of composition, compounds produced, and bacterial functionality. This means that the future holds many exciting new applications for synthetic communities. They could be used as research models to test new food supplements or food formulations. They could even be used to model microbiomes from other ecosystems, such as those from Alejandro's project from soil and plants. And they could even be used as food supplements themselves, which will make them probiotics. And with the addition of a compound that stimulates them, they could be administered as symbiotics. And this would be to promote infant health, for example, by supporting food digestion or to even cure disease. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alejandro, Hannah, and An Antanasia, for your excellent uh, work being done and your fine presentation today. One more big hand for these three bright young scientists. Now I would like to give the floor to our Dean of uh, Research, Wouter Hendricks, to hand out the Research Award. Wouter. All right. Hello. Yep. Last year we handed out the Research Awards. You're well aware of uh, what we did. We had a uh, marvelous uh, research paper. This year the Graduate Schools of Wageningen University, the six Graduate Schools, in conjunction with the University van Wageningen, has basically come up with a slightly modified or new concept. Now, because you don't want to listen to uh, an old person like me standing here explaining to you how, this, how we've changed everything, um, a, and the short period of time we have been given to present this, we have a uh, particular video that you will see for two minutes and see the winners. <laughs> The way we value research and researchers is changing. Where the emphasis previously was on individual performance, there's now more room for valuing team performance and academic leadership. In addition, collaboration with society is becoming increasingly important to address and solve contemporary issues. We would like to illustrate this development with our research award. In recent years, the award has been presented to one individual young researcher. Now, we add the following categories, team effort, Transdisciplinary Research, and Supervisor of the Year. With these categories, we reflect the broader appreciation for science and our scientists. The winner of the Research Paper of the Year shows that original and founding science is being conducted within Wageningen University. The research contributes to a better understanding of the world we live in. The winner of the Team Effort of the Year shows that collaboration creates synergy and can be instrumental for research. Teamwork has clear added value. The winner of the Transdisciplinary Research of the Year shows that complex problems often require input from various disciplines and the involvement of societal partners. The winner of the Supervisor of the Year Award is an inspiration and supportive mentor for their PhD candidates and postdocs. And the winners are... Before I ask the 
winners of the four awards uh, to join the podium. This morning, basically, we've had pitches for, from all the winners and other selected um, individuals and groups. And the audience decided the winner. So the audience got the vote and had to mark which research paper, interdisciplinary research, which uh, group and also which uh, supervisor of the year would win the award. Now, all of, all of them were, were excellent. We hope that next year, Caroline, we could be having some pitches here to show you the research, but the time doesn't allow it. So therefore, I'd like to now invite the winners of the four awards on the podium. So please give a hand of applause for these winners for the Research Awards. I'd like to acknowledge that the team of the year, Paul, came from, uh, the name of the team is Paul, it came from Animal Sciences, and I did not vote for that team. However, the winner of the interdisciplinary research they won it by one vote from team number two. And my vote made the difference. <laughs> I'm grateful to Wageningen Graduate Schools, the six graduate schools, and the University of Wageningen for providing also the awards in terms of funding. So each uh, team supervisor will receive 2,500 euros and a bunch of flowers and eternal glory for the next year. Thank you for that. Thank you, Walter, for acquitting you of your task, and congratulations to all four, but even more, because they are team's winners. The audience, uh, we change now to uh, the transfer of directorship, and please allow me to use a few words to say a few things, and then we get the thing done, so to say, and get this chain off my shoulder. <laughs> I know you're waiting for that. Uh, a lot of people asked me um, the last several months, how did you now really experience this rectorship? These nine years of duty uh, as a rector. And after giving it a thought, it was not so complex. Uh, it, it, it needs a few lines. In my family, so that's the family mole, M-O-L, so it stands also for mole in English, the small animal who creeps in the soil. We, have, uh, we are not uh, uh, from a very uh, rich background or something, but we still have for a long time a motto with the family. And the motto is, Fodio et ingredio. And exactly that motto is saying how I experience that. And not all of you are fluent in Latin, neither am I. Uh, so I'll translate that for you. Uh, and the best translation in Dutch is, Ik vroed en vorder. And in English, it would be something like, I root around and book progress. And I think that's a little bit how I experience my rectorship, which comes very close to my family history, of course, but also tells a little bit on, uh, yeah, that you, as a rector, you try to make progress, but it's not always an easy job. And it was not always easy because uh, little did I expect it nine years ago what these nine years would look like. Uh, when I stepped in, the rectorship nine years ago and took over from Martin Krop, my predecessor, the world looked really different. Uh, we didn't have that polarization so strongly in the world, and even on campus, on a macro level and a micro level. We also didn't know a lot about pandemics and COVID, and we've seen them coming and going and need to be prepared for uh, probably another one. 
We also had not so much an inward-looking country in the Netherlands, which we have today. It was very still an open uh, country, which looks to the outside world, and that's not always the case today. And we also had not such a large vulnerability of execute, executive board members, which we have today, and I also look at my colleagues there. Uh, and I quickly also have to admit then directly, because I'm still a rector, that I uh, for a long time omitted one of my ancillary activities. So I have now to announce that uh, once again. <laughs> so I hope it still can still be on the record. Well, maybe on second thought, it's not an ancillary activity. Maybe some see it as the main job of a rector. Also. <laughs> but we see also, of course, a good of a lot of good things happening in this past nine years. So when I started, the idea of interdisciplinarity was still very much at the periphery of our academic institutions. It's no longer there. The idea of sustainability was really at marginal groups, still there in society and also in academia, and is now one of the core values which you cannot do without as a societal partner or as an academic institution. So that's for the dynamics which were there. But of course, what we also saw is a lot of stability and continuity in our institutions. So over the nine years, we as academic institutions and Wageningen University and research have continuously to strive for academic excellence and integrity. We continue to have our education basically on campus and not only online. Wageningen University and research as all the other Dutch universities and also the international partners we work with are very strongly on keeping their independence. And they continuously serve science and society in that. And they continuously to be international and outward looking and inclusive. So in that sense, universities are beacons of continuity and stability. And in that continuity and stability, I think we also booked some progress in the last year. And here's just one slide to say something on how many new networks and institutes we have established in the past nine years, uh, and which we have been working so closely together as Wagner University and Research. We see also, and I just knew, mentioned a few things, the tremendous increase of uh, female professors in Wagner University and Research and also in other universities in the Netherlands. I remind you, we are now also at Women's Day today, so it's very good to mention that also. Um, We've also seen the campus expanding and the budget expanding. Maybe not as much as we had hoped for nine years ago, but still, I think that is a major achievement. And we continue to be excellent in Wagner University, in research, and I can say that now as director, in education, in research in our domain, in also being a sustainable campus, and in transparency as an academic institution. And I think that are quite nice institutions in this balance between continui continuity in academic institutions and a world outside there which is rapidly changing. So times indeed seem constantly to be changing, but see, remain seeing the larger picture of that. Before we go over to hanging this chain to uh, my successor, I want to say a few words of thanks. And I cannot thank everyone which I worked with for the past nine years, and many of you are also there, and I extremely appreciate that. So I do it a little bit by groups, and I use also some pictures which I took from uh, various trips to more uh, art museum types of qualities. First, I want to mention those people who I was allowed to serve, our students and academic staff. It has been a great honor to serve you, and I thank you also for making it not too difficult, at least not too often too difficult, uh, for me as a rector. I really enjoyed serving you, and I think that you're doing a great job here in your studies as well as your academic uh, research and education. Secondly, I want also to thank those people who I collaborate with. The executive board, the former one and the present one, which I work together. The rector is magnificent, and I pictured them here as really super persons who come from the sky constantly if there's something wrong there. But these super persons, they at least have a lifeline, which is a little bit different from the normal superman, which is portrayed. I also thank the collaborators from uh, uh, the president of the TU2 Institute, which I have so much joint collaborations and meetings, and where we set up such a nice way of collaborating together, the Applied Research Institutes in the Netherlands. Um, 
And of course, also, I felt very much also uh, a good collaboration with our partners in the ministries, uh, in our academic networks in the Netherlands and throughout the world, uh, the business and the societal organizations where we work with. There's also then a category of people I want to thank which supported me uh, and which all those nine years helped me. Uh, and I also deliberately put first here uh, the supervisory board. Although they are meant to supervise me and the academic uh, or the, the executive board, I felt them much more as supporters of me. So on behalf of me, to you, Albert, but also, of course, to the entire uh, supervisory board, thank you very much for that. But of course, also, I was very much supported by what we sometimes call the middle management in our institution, uh, the ABCD group, or whatever we call them, but also the professors and the business unit managers, but especially also the supporting staff and the secretaries. Without all of you, I would have been nowhere, and also neither will be my successor. Sorry for that, Caroline, but you have them all, and you can build on them. And finally, lastly, I also want to thank those who are very close to me, my friends and my family. <laughs> Sometimes I felt like really being exhausted, uh, hanging on the wall or something. And they were always there to support me. And I thank them really very much for that. And also they were there if I was getting a little bit too high above the ground and thought that really Wageningen was almost heaven on earth. They really also put my foot very much below the ground, <laughs> which is very adequate, I think, for a mole, so to say. <laughs> right, I think with that, things are packed together, at least in my office. Uh, and I think it's time to transfer the chain to uh, the new rector. Um, so I'm very happy that we have such a magnificent successor of me. I would really like to call upon the floor Caroline, Professor Caroline Kruse, the next rector of Wagner University of Research. Please. I would almost keep this chain if you <laughs> <laughs> joking. Okay, this transfer always is a little bit a ceremonial thing, and uh, my colleague recommends if you know exactly how it goes. If you are not sure when you should start clapping, just always, as you did for the past nine years, look at the rector, and then he gives the signal when it's done. With transferring this chain, I transfer also to you all the rights and privileges, but also the duties and responsibilities as the 49th Rector of Wagner University and Research. Uh, and I really am very happy that you will succeed me. And I ask the Mace Bearer to help me to get rid of this chain. Salve, Recta Magnifici. Iterum, iterumke, salve. Congratulations. Vale, recto magnifice, iterumque vale. Honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I am so happy that this moment has arrived. I feel honored and privileged to be the next Rector Magnificus and Vice President of Wageningen University and Research. 
I've always been very proud to be part of this organization. Proud of the teaching, research and impact for healthy food and a healthy living environment. We answer important questions. How to feed people in the future on a planet that's suffering from global warming, biodiversity loss and water security issues. Today we've heard three great pitches of our young scientists and a wonderful keynote of Nicole about the microbiome and how important the microbiome is for life on Earth. And that we often overlook it and take it for granted. And that struck me. Because somehow the same goes for education. I think we often overlook and take for granted the impact that teaching has on the lives of our young people, our students. We are training the next generation of experts that will be the change agents that we need for the transitions in society that we are looking for, the energy transition, the protein transition. Our students of today are the generation that's going to make the difference. Another reason why I'm pr proud of this organization is that we excel in research. First of all, by keeping a strong fundament. Only when our disciplinary science is strong, we can join forces to address the grand challenges in our domain. Future pathways towards sustainable food, climate, water and nature require multi-inter and transdisciplinary approaches. And I think our unique campus is the best place for that and the breeding ground for those approaches. We have impact in society. I was trained in a tradition where scientists were invited to leave their ivory towers and to reach out to stakeholders in society, to co-create the, the futures that we want, to really find answers together, realizing that science alone cannot provide the answers that society is looking for. For me, finding answers together has many meanings, the word together. It means together combining natural and social sciences, but also combining the fundamental and applied sciences, or combining research and education, but also the collaboration with our stakeholders in society and governments in Wageningen, in the Netherlands, and abroad. And we are focusing on an international domain, so I'm very happy that many of our international partners are here today with us. I'm looking forward to contribute to all of that in the years to come. I'm also very much looking forward to the implementation of the new academic career framework. That is our Wageningen translation of the National Recognition and Rewards Program. I think it will make our scientists happier and therefore our science better. But I also think it will only be successful if it goes hand in hand with a change in our academic culture. A change towards values that I personally hold very high. It's about di more diversity in academic profiles and academic output. More flexibility, more open science, and more team science, more togetherness. The new academic framework is now, at this moment, only a piece of paper. It's describing procedures, indicators, and performance areas. But I think we all realize that a culture change will never happen because of a piece of paper. It requires investment in people, in training, in dialogues. And I'm very willing to make that investment. Ladies and gentlemen, it's almost time now to give the floor to our president, Schauke Heimo Vara. But before I do that, I would like to say a few words to Arthur Mol. Arthur, you've been a wonderful rector. I think the past nine years were very good years for Wageningen University and research, and you played an important role in that. Actually, you're setting the standard very high for me. I can only hope that I will be as good as the rector as you have been for us over the past years. You will be my role model. And I'm very happy and glad that you will be, for the coming months at least, just across the street from me to reach out if I have questions. 
So thank you very, very much. And now, ladies and gentlemen, And then now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to pass on the floor to our president, Schalke Removara. Please, Schalke. Thank you. Welcome, distinguished guests. First, I would like to welcome Professor Kruse as our new Rector Magnificus. Caroline, I have already got to know you a little and I'm really looking forward to, together with Renz, working for Univer uh, Wageningen University and research. I'm also incredibly proud that 123 years after our first female student enrolled the then Rijkslandbouwhogeschool, 72 years after our first female professor, Professor Fisser, was appointed here, and 10 years after we welcomed our first female president, Professor Fresco, we have chosen, uh, we have now a woman as rector. We have chosen the best candidate, but with this we have also done justice to all these women who have for more than 100 years, side by side with men and other genders, made word to what we are today. We will work to ensure that the talents of the broad diversity of our students and staff will be present at all levels of our, uh, of our institute better than it is today. And then I would like to dedicate a few words to Arthur. In a gentle way, you can shake the world. A quote attributed to Arthur Pendragon, also known as King Arthur. Ever since the 12th century, people have been telling the legend of King Arthur, of the round table and the many battles he fought. Today I will take a brief look back at our own Wageningen Arthur, his battles, and his importance for were. <laughs> I will outline the landscape in which Arthur arrived, the achievements of his reign, and a brief sketch of his style. In a gentle way, you can shake the world. Arthur did not begin his reign by pulling a sword out of a stone, but by putting on the chain of office in 2015, just like we have seen before. When Arthur started, Wuhr was in a period of growth after some lesser years. We had grown to around 10,000 students and a little under 6,000 staff. Our, repu our academic, re academic reputation was looking good and we had just moved to the current campus. And together with Louise, Thijs and Renz and the whole of the Wuhr community, he took Wageningen from there to where we are today with 13,000 students and almost 8,000 staff. A knowledge institution that shows the true collaboration between discovery and applied science. A truly international institution and a real pact, impact on its well-defined domain. Arthur himself is a living example of a scientist who is not constrained by silos. He graduated as an environmental scientist and completed his PhD as a social scientist, an environmental social scientist. He has been a professor with universities in China and Malaysia, next to his professorship here. And from this background, he has worked tirelessly to promote Wageningen and to promote Wageningen's multi strands and interdisciplinary approach as well as its global scope. And this then is one of the important battles in which Arthur has distinguished himself. Which brings me to the many important feats of arms that Arthur has achieved for this fine institution. 
And it reminded me of The Noble Acts of King Arthur and the Round Table by Thomas Deloney. Oh, Arthur's reign, a timeless tale, where truth and hon honor shall prevail. Its legends sung and stories told, the Round Table's glory will unfold. In Wageningen, we have our own round table in our boardroom. From where we try to carefully steer this institution. The tale of our own Arthur tells of many battles. Some fought at this very table. He has worked on the foundations of war by, for example, rebuilding the education staff department. He has made sure that the growing number of students could actually be educated with the quality we strive for with the extended daytime schedule, for example. And he has managed to reduce the number of resits to ease some of the pressure of our teachers. Because when Arthur took office, the pressure on the organization was great. The numbers had grown, but the resources had not. Fortunately, during his time here, the relief has come. But with it, a great challenge to distribute that just and transparent. So the use of the Van Rijn resources, the sector plan resources, the startup and incentive grants have all been done by him. And that may sound a lot simpler than it is. And Arthur has always arranged this with ample consultation, with also, but also with the creativity and the wit that is needed. He has also worked on renewing our university. For example, by shaping Tenure Track 2.0, but now, together with our new rector, as she has just explained, by taking the important step to shape the new framework for recognition and rewards. And Arthur has been one of the driving forces behind the AVU Alliance, the alliance between the universities of Eindhoven, Wageningen, Utrecht, and the UMCU. And there are many other feats of arms that have involved quite a battle. For all of these, he had to overcome opposition. And in doing so, he sat around this round table with all involved, with his characteristic tirelessness, optimism and positivity, and always with the commitment to come out of it together. It is not the years in your life that count, but it is the life in your years said Arthur Pendragon, and our Arthur lives by it. The amount of life, work, and hours you can squeeze into one day is truly impressive. His last battleground as rector was outside of Wageningen, where he fought for self-government, self regie on behalf of the universities of the Netherlands, and in doing so, trying to protect the important international character of our academia. The poet Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote of Arthur, far other is this battle in the West, where do we move than when we strove in youth. But as it goes, rectors come and rectors go. We are delighted that Arthur is not leaving us. He will continue to dedicate himself to science, educating, education, and to international collaborations for and in Wageningen. And I suspect with the same work ethic as we, as we, have, to come to, as we have come to expect from him. And his fame is such that there are already games on sale that allow you to witness his future exploits. And in keeping with the demands of time, they are entirely Dutch spoken. King Arthur is quoted as saying, Camelot lives in the hearts of those who believe in its ideals. And I would say, were lives in the heart of those who live, believe in its ideals. And Arthur is certainly one of them. I have really enjoyed working with you and being charged with your energy and optimism. And of, on behalf of all of us, I would like to thank you. And according to tradition, we want to capture the legend of our Arthur 
on the wall with the portrait gallery of our rectors. So may I ask you, Arthur, to join me so we can unveil your portrait together. I'm missing something. Hmm? I'm missing something. Yeah. <laughs> Dank u. Dank u. We moeten nog heel even zitten. Oké. Okay. Daar is het voor alle van u. En ik ben blij te zeggen dat we onze wand hebben veranderd om een beetje meer te laten zien van onze gemeenschap. Maar dat zal we later later zien. Dat zal we later zien. Dat zal Unveiled. And now I would like to give the word to our mayor, who wants to specifically thank you for the collaboration with the city of Wageningen. Thank you, President Hemovara. Um, I would first uh, like to congratulate the new Rector Magnificus, Caroline Kruse, Professor Caroline Kruse, with uh, her rectorship. And uh, we are, as a municipality, of course, looking forward to the further collaboration. Uh, and we are uh, sure that that will be a great collaboration ahead. But I would also like to, um, to take the opportunity to say some words to former Rector Magnificus, Arthur Moll. Um, so, um, guests, distinguished guests, excellencies, on behalf of the city of uh, Wageningen, I would like to thank you today for your uh, significant contributions to Wageningen over the past nine years. Although the university has said goodbye to the locations in our historic city center and has centered its activities here on the beautiful Wageningen campus, I dare to say that the figurative distance between city and university, between society and academic community has become closer than before. Your personal efforts, together with the entire board, of course, during the past decade contributed significantly to this. A great example is our joint city agenda, which you personally support, and we work together to improve the environment in which we live and work together here in Wageningen. You encourage students to participate in local projects, to import, improve the quality of life in our joint hometown. And your enthusiasm pays off. It has already led to a great collaborations in the past years. For example, students are working on greening our city. Another group is focusing on socially strengthening the Nude, one of our neighborhoods, a third group is investigating how uh, locals can create a project to build and live in nature inclusive surrounding. As mentioned, we have also met as the executive of the municipality and with you personally regularly over the past years. What always struck me is that, that you have been very approachable and you, were very, you are very interested in people you make them feel at ease and approach them in a positive way. You do this also during difficult times because you have also carried an important burden of governing the university, for example, during the COVID crisis and making sure that the social distancing doesn't mean that the, dis the distance went too big during that uh, period and that contact with students and staff during these circumstances kept going. We also experienced uh, fun things together. Uh, of course, the yearly opening of the annual inter introduction days for new students. Uh, I enjoyed that personally always when you suggested at last minute to ignore the proposed program and start improvising. And we had uh, some fun uh, baking scrambled eggs and handing it out to the students, which you did for all those nine years. And I only joined last year uh, in doing so. So, dear Arthur, ladies and gentlemen, back to uh, more serious matters. Because earlier, 
the research awards has already been awarded, but as municipality of Wageningen, we are presenting a new award today. The City of Life Sciences Award. This award is intended as a special appreciation for persons or organizations that have made essential contributions to the connection between city and university within Wageningen. Um, and Wageningen is the city of life sciences. It will not surprise you all that you, Arthur, are the first person to receive this award. And this City of Life Sciences Award includes a gift. There's a small tree I will hand to you uh, for your green spaces back at home. But um, we will plant a tree, a larger tree, um, a sweet chestnut in the Torque Park, a place where the university once started, with the main building uh, then called uh, the Bassecour, uh, the main building of the then called Agricultural University, was situated. And this tree symbolizes the growing connection, growing joint contacts, and growing cooperation between the city and Wageningen University and research. By planting trees, we also benefit a lot of other things, so combat glo uh, global warming, uh, help biodiversity, and yeah, that's also something that we as a city and the university together stand for, and but you also personally. So thank you again for what you have meant for Wageningen over the past nine years, but also much longer because you also um, study here. And I wish your, you all the best in the working years ahead. Um, and we, we'll hand over you the smaller tree, but also the special, um, uh, and there's a big picture behind me that we'll, we'll um, show, but also a special sign that was, uh, was um, made by um, one of the famous um, Wageningen painters, Henk van Ruitenbeek, and I will present you that award. If you please may come up the stage. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. This, this is a tree, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, floor. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the ceremony is now coming almost to an end. But before we do that, a few words of thanks. First of all, to Nicole Dublier for your wonderful keynote. I think we all will look at the microbiome in a different way after today. I also want to thank our three young scientists for their pitches, Alejandro, Hannah, and Anastasia. Thank you very, very much. And congr congratulations once more to the winners of the four prizes. Wonderful. You all did very, very well. I'm very much looking forward to the years to, the years to come. And I'm also very much looking forward to meeting you all at the reception that will be starting in a minute somewhere here in Orium. <laughs> so with this, uh, I formally am closing this academic service. Thank you very much. And um, before I forget, Arthur should not forgive, forget. <laughs>